Yes, hello. Welcome to Grace Health Facebook Live. My name is Miriam Scherer. I'm a family practice PA here at Grace Health. I've had the pleasure of being at Grace Health for just over 14 years. And I'm here today to talk about diabetes. Um, really quick before we start um, the, the, the group today, um, I want to say that there are some prizes um, that, that, can, that can be won. There is um, both a $50 Visa and Buyer gift cards, an air fryer, um, winter, a winter basket, and tickets for the Grand Rapids Griffin hockey game. So to be able to be entered for that, we'll just ask that you can, if you call um, the phone number 269-441-6801. It should be on the pin here in, in the message too. And, and please leave your name and phone number. And if you're the winner of one of the prizes, someone will be um, contacting you to let you know how to receive your prize. <laughs> okay. So how today's is going to work is um, for, we're going to hear here for an hour. So the first half of the um, time, I'm going to just give a general um, uh, general discussion about diabetes. I'm going to set it up so that I'm actually kind of answering questions that a lot of my patients commonly ask me um, about diabetes. So I'm kind of going to answer in that in that way, and then we're going to open up the second half, the second 30 minutes for questions. So um, we're hoping as you listen, um, if some questions come to mind that you'd like answered, go ahead and put it in the post and I'll try to get to ma as many of those as we can. I do ask that we try to keep the questions very um, very general. We don't want to be you know, discussing any really um, private personal um, health information on such a public site like this. So just kind of general diabetic questions or things that kind of come up as, as I'm talking today. Um, so again, live to you here for the diabetic talk, and you know I think it's important to note that diabetes is something that, our, our, as providers, we see this on a daily basis. Through my years here, I've unfortunately seen some really devastating complications that many patients have had related to diabetes. So it's really a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. You know, so that's why I'm here today to talk to you guys about it. Okay, so question one, what exactly is diabetes? What does that mean? So diabetes is a condition where you make too much um, <clears throat> sugar in both your blood and in the urine. And it generally happens over time when your body isn't able to make, when your hormone insulin isn't able to process the carbohydrates that we eat, okay? And when you hear the term carbohydrates, um, people differ, think of different things. So I want to kind of be clear what all carbohydrates encompasses. So carbs come in many forms, not just candy and sweets, though that is probably the area that most people think of um, when you know, they think carbs. Um, but other categories are things like breads and pastas and potatoes and rice. And then within these categories, we were talking about bread, you know, that includes regular bread rolls, um, tortillas, um, any of those kind of, um, of foods, you know, are counted in that. In terms of the pasta category, that includes spaghetti, that includes ravioli, that includes ramen noodles, um, any of those type of foods that, that, that's a noodle or pasta and in any way counts as a carb as well. Um, and then in the potato category, that's where you're going to come in with chips and um, fries and those kind of foods, not just a potato, but that can include white potato, sweet potato, really any potato variety. And then of course there is your your other category, what I would call. So that's things like crackers and chips um, and cookies and sweets and, and bars, including Nutri-Grain bars, granola bars. So all of those are in that carbohydrate category. So when I'm talking about carbs, we know what foods I'm talking about. Okay, 
And there's also a little bit of differentiation within carbs. There's your simple carbs and the complex carbohydrates. Your complex carbohydrates, the majority of those are going to be your fruits and vegetables, okay? Most of all the other ones that I was just talking about are gonna be more your simple carbs. So those complex carbs are really the ones you wanna eat more of. Those are your healthier carbs, okay? And just to kind of give you a, a sense in your head of kind of what, how the body processes that. So picture yourself on a roller coaster. I think we've all been on a roller coaster at some point in, in our lives, so we could kind of um, think about that. So you're on that roller coaster, you're like, oh, I'm hungry, I want something to eat, right? So here you are on the roller coaster, you're going up, you're, you're starting to eat, like, oh yeah, I feel better, you know, I'm getting full, I'm, I'm, I'm eating, okay? And then depending on what that is that you ate, was it complex carbs, simple carb, you know, those kind of things. Eventually your body metabolizes what you eat and then the, sh the sugar goes up and then it starts coming down as your body digests and processes that. Now, depending on the kind of carb, those simple carbs, you know, those noodles, those candy bars, those pretzels, you know, that's gonna make you go up and crash down a lot faster. Um, I think we all kind of know that that feeling after lunch, you know, you feel like you need a nap, you're just tired. And a lot of that can be related to how, what you had for that last meal, you know, so it causes a little bit more of an up and down roller coaster, having more of those simple carbs. The complex carbohydrates, you're gonna have a little more gentle up and down on that roller coaster when you think of that. And that's kind of your goal. You don't want these up and down um, crashes where you feel good and then you crash, you're good and you crash. You really want it to be a more even roller coaster. Maybe not exciting in the roller coaster world, but for your body, much healthier for you. <laughs> okay, and then just a quick thing about um, why diabetes, you know, why do you hear so much about diabetes, right? It's like, why is it so important? Why do I keep hearing so much about it? Well, one is just, it's so common. One in three, one in three adult Americans are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. That's a lot, you know, think about one in three of us. So even if it's not yourself that has diabetes, probably diabetes is affecting you somehow in your life because there's probably a loved one that you have that is diabetic. So very, very, very prevalent. So that's one of the reasons important. Another is unfortunately is how devastating effects you can get from diabetes when it is not well controlled. Um, so when I was originally talking about what diabetes means in terms of that high sugar that's in the blood and that's in the urine, Okay, so because your blood is in your whole body, right? Your, so your blood goes from your eyes, your brain, all the way down your heart, your kidneys, your gut, your toes, right? Your blood flows throughout your whole body. So diabetes is really a whole body disease. Um, and some of the, you know, complications that we tend to see related to diabetes, one is definitely visual problems. It's still worldwide, it's unfortunately the leading cause of blindness. Um, so obviously a very devastating result, right, to be able to lose your, your, your vision uh, related to diabetes. And that has to do with what the diabetes is doing to those blood vessels that are behind your eyes. We have really small blood vessels behind your eyes and the diabetes is affecting those and causing damage there. And that's what's causing that, that troubles with the, with the vision. Um, it also can really negatively affect your kidneys to the point where we definitely have many patients that end up on what's called dialysis or hemodialysis, where they have to have regular blood um, taken in and out because of how damaging that diabetes has done to your kidneys. And then of course there's those, those vascular complications, these patients that are losing their toes, their feet, their legs. Um, this is a process that happens because the diabetes affects, again, all the blood vessels. And the blood vessels we have, especially to our feet and our toes, of course our toes are reasonably small, right? So the blood vessels there are also reasonably small. 
And what's happening is it's literally causing damage to both those blood vessels there. And when it causes damage to the blood vessels, your body cannot heal right. And so say you, you know, do go barefoot, which we don't recommend as a diabetic, but happens, and you get a little cut, a little sore in your, you know, but you think nothing of it. But as a diabetic, your body is not healing well from that. And that sore can progress on, on to the point where um, the surgeon has to take that toe or foot or whole leg or whatnot. I have had patients that have had, had progressively more um, toe, foot, leg taken um, over time. So just devastating, obviously, as you you know can imagine in terms of a, in terms of complication. The other complication that we see so often in the office is what's called neuropathy, diabetic neuropathy. Neuropathy is a term that means damage to the nerves. So very similar concept with the blood is that we also have nerve endings throughout our body. And again, the idea with those small nerve endings, seem like small blood vessels get affected first, that's the same with the feet with diabetes. So <clears throat> what happens a lot of times is you start getting this horrible burning, tingling, stabbing, feels like someone's getting you in there with a needle. Again, oftentimes in the feet, but can progress on into the legs, can be in the arms, can eventually really affect any nerve but really a devastating pain, pain that can be very hard to treat and manage, and as you can imagine, can be disabling to the person in terms of their mobility and those kind of things. So all, just those are just some of the complications we see um, from, from diabetes. Um, so it's obviously something that we take very seriously, and that's why we're here talking to you today about it. So one of the most important things, um, is, okay, so now I'm already diabetic now, like what, what exactly am I supposed to be doing? So step one, I think, is to establish a really good relationship with your primary provider, okay? Whether that's a PA, MD, NP, uh, we've got some amazing providers at, at Grace Health. Um, so establish that relationship with your provider so that they know you and you know them because really it's a partnership in terms of the provider and patient. If you try to always make it so that it's something, um, so the diabetes is like you feel like you have some control in managing yourself. So it's a really, that partnership is really step one. Another important piece is being what we call compliant with medicines. Take your medicines like you're supposed to. And I know it can be very daunting when you're told you have to take X, Y, and Z medicines. The list ends up being maybe longer than what you would have liked. Um, and I think the key is understanding the reason why you're taking them. So don't be afraid to ask your provider questions. Why, why am I taking this medicine? What is this one for? What is this one for? We're never upset about answering those kind of questions because if you understand your diseases and your medicines and things and why you're taking them, I feel like you can be a more active part in managing your, your diabetes along with myself, for example, a, as a provider. So those are really important steps to get to be the healthiest version of yourself and to get the diabetes managed as good as possible. Um, and the other thing that I think Grace Health really is, is in a unique process in that we have not just amazing providers, of course I love my colleagues, is we have also some um, really amazing staff and a variety um, of ways to help you along with your diabetes. Um, so for example, we have a registered dietitian and I am so grateful to have her here. She really helps, um, she, really, she meets one-on-one -on -one with you to figure out how you can make, um, how you can follow this diabetic, how to make your life livable diet-wise with something that you could do. She's amazing. We also have healthy lifestyle counselors that also provide us some great you know, counseling in terms of that. Um, we, have, we have our pharmacy now at Grace Health. 
And that's just been really wonderful because the pharmacists are able to, of course, not just supply you know, these needed medications um, to patients, but we even have um, pharmacists that are able to do what we call medication reconciliation. So if you are on a, a number of medications, um, and maybe you're a little confused what timing, what goes with what, and that she, you know, we're able to, she can sit down with you and really go through that. And also for us, when our patients use our pharmacy, it's really helpful because if we have a concern with a specific medicine or interaction, we've got that pharmacist right there that we can answer. And it really just ends up being a really good partnership. So that's something we've been really blessed to be able to have at Grace too, is, is, is the pharmacy. We also have um, what are called resource specialists. They help with a little bit more basic of needs, like if there's concerns with you know housing and, and just being able to afford food and, and you know those kind of more basic things. We have that, and then um, we also have this wonderful program, the Fresh Food Pharmacy, where if you're eligible, you can get fresh food, you know, delivered either to Grace or, or to your home, kind of depending on what there is availability. And the patients so far that have been doing this plan have really loved it because it really has some great fresh foods and some great recipe ideas for some healthy food choices. And last and definitely not least is all our amazing nurses and MAs and support staff that really um, help with their education, help with their patients, and all help us do an amazing job so we can keep you guys as healthy as we can. Okay, so a little bit more nitty and gritty about the diabetic diet. Okay, so what specifically can I eat? You know, patients ask me a lot more details on that piece of it, because eating matters. We love food, we all love to eat, right? So how can we do it in a more healthy way? So again, number one, partner with your physician, because I think sometimes there needs to be individual, individual um, meal plan, different things that might be specific to you, you know, depending on other, other underlying health issues or digestive issues or those things. So yes, talk to your provider. Um, generally, a diabetic diet would be one that's considered um, really rich in fruits and vegetables and low in saturated fats and try to increase lean protein wherever you, or wherever you can. So with the lean protein, we're talking chicken, fish probably are gonna be your top two. Some cuts of pork can be reasonably lean. If you're not a meat eater, certainly soy, tofu can be also great lean protein sources too. So options there. Um, in terms of the, the veggies, we kind of going back to that original conversation we had with those types of carbs um, and that they're even within the vegetable category there's your more um, starchy vegetables which have a little higher sugar versus a non-starchy your top two starchier sugarier vegetables probably going to be corn is going to be up there as number one and then i would say um, probably peas are going to be next. So those are ones that have a little bit more sugar to them. Doesn't mean you can't have them at all, but just realize their sugar content may be a little higher than some other non-starchy vegetables like your spinach, cauliflower, broccoli, tomatoes, um, a pretty long list with the non-starchy. So that, that's good. That gives you more options. Um, things I like to focus on is trying to grill or bake wherever possible. You know, try to limit that amount of, of oil, you know, that you use. Um, I'll say I love my air fryer and one of the, the uh, items that we're uh, raffling off. But um, yeah, air fryers can be great, grills can be great, and even say if it's, you know, in the middle of winter, we're in Michigan, right, lots of winter, it's I think some of those, like even those little tabletop grills can be really helpful too because they cook the food pretty fast and they kind of have that, all that fat kind of slide down. So it can make even cuts of meat that might have a little bit more fat, a little bit leaner. And you can even grill like vegetables on there. I've seen people do like zucchini squash, those, you know, those kind of things. Um, in the air fryer, I do my meats in there and you can roast your vegetables in there. So for example, roasted cauliflower, you spray a little bit of you look a little a Pam or some kind of spray and maybe a non-salt seasoning that you like on there and boy is it delicious. So there are really some great things um, that you can make um, that can still be healthy. Okay, so a good way of kind of picturing to make it a little easier to think about is what I'd call a healthy plate. 
so you know picture your plate ideally we want the smaller size plate not a huge plate but whatever size dishes you have will make that work so with your plate imagine cutting that plate in half all right i want half of that plate 50 percent of that plate to be basically fruits and vegetables whether that's a side salad, whether that's mixed vegetables um, that you've steamed or cooked, um, whether it's some fruit that you just cut up and put on the side, really doesn't matter, but you wanna picture that half of that plate with those, those yummy fruits and vegetables. And then only doing that second half of the plate, that other half, your main dish, you know, maybe your spaghetti or your burger, or, you know, one of those kind of things. So that helps just in and of itself kind of picturing your plate in that way. Other ways to make the foods that we like a little healthier. One is that I would recommend trying to go with a whole grain or whole wheat wherever possible over white. So if you're having that sandwich, say, you know, if you can pick the whole grain bread, that's already going to be a little bit less starch and a little bit more of that complex starch, a little bit less of this roller coaster and more a little bit even keel. So that's one thing. Same thing with pastas. Pastas have some whole grain, whole wheat varieties. Okay, so I would recommend again, always picking the whole grain wheat over just that white regular pasta noodle. And I know some people even do where you kind of turn that vegetable into a noodle, like there's things called uh, like spiralizers that you can use say like squash or zucchini or something you know and you can kind of turn that into a noodle so it kind of almost has that same kind of consistency and texture and texture excuse me but maybe um you know it doesn't have that that starch as much to it so that's kind of ways of making foods that we like healthier you know and if it helps you picture that half of that plate with those veggies and fruits that's that's great biggest pie the biggest thing is we really want to limit those saturated fats saturated fats you know come in a variety of ways i would say when you're thinking fast food a lot of our common fast food chains are really loaded in their foods with saturated fat that's where your burgers your fries your shakes you know that's where those foods are going to come in so those foods just unfortunately not really healthy foods you want to try to avoid those fast foods and even processed foods as much as you as much as you can because they're just not really healthy options um, as a diabetic. And there's a lot of, especially a lot of sweets that I would call my double whammy. So those are the kind of sweets that have a lot of sugar, but they also have a lot of saturated fat. So you're getting both both things, and that's things like cakes pies, donuts, and then packaged sweets like ho-ho, zingers, uh, nutty bars. I'm, just, I'm sure the list can go on and on with what your favorite sweet is. But those are really your foods you want to do as, as minimal as possible because you're just not getting nutrition a lot from those and they really pack a bad punch in terms of not good health-wise, especially for diabetes, but certainly for a number of other health issues as well. So people, patients ask me, okay, so I'm having a sweet craving. What do I eat? I want something sweet. <laughs> so one thing, if you like chocolate, you know, if you can pick a little bit darker, um, a higher cocoa content to the chocolate, meaning a dark chocolate versus a milk chocolate, you definitely get less carbohydrate there. And a lot of times it can kind of crave that sweet craving too, but you're not feeling as bad in terms of the sugar you're putting into your body. Another thing is just having a piece of a, a small piece of fruit um, can sometimes crave that. Now, if you just can't get that, you know, if you can't cut it with that stuff and you just have to have your favorite food, try to have a smaller portion of that favorite food and try to not have it all the time. You know, I would say those kind of circumstances. Sometimes we have our moments. Do your best to not make those moments all the time. Okay. Oh, and then I get a lot of questions about exercise what kind of exercise is best what should i be doing i think any exercise is great my goal for my patients is to try to get 15 minutes in every day and that doesn't mean it's all at once right it can be three to five minutes here there wherever you can fit it in so um 
there's probably kind of two main types of exercise. There's your aerobic, that's the, the make you sweat kind, you know, and that's going to probably burn off more of those extra carb calories. But then there's also your strength training. That's things like free weights, you know, if you like to do weights or resistance bands or those kind of things. That helps build lean muscle, which also then helps the metabolism and that. And they, together, they really are helpful. Doing some aerobic and some strength training together, you really tend to see the most impact on your body, on your diabetes. And a lot of the studies, the medical studies, have found that it doesn't take necessarily a ton of weight loss to see good results with your diabetes. Uh, a lot of times, only about 5% weight loss can result, can result in significantly better diabetic outcomes. You know, so it's, I think these are reasonable goals. So every, like I said, every exercise counts, whether it's just a matter that you're gonna park a little bit farther away from the supermarket or the grocery store, try to pick that farther spot, or, um, you know, go out after dinner, have a walk with your kids, go out and play with your, you know, play with your kids, whatever it is. Throw on a music video, do a little dance party in your living room. Anything that makes your body move is gonna be great, and it doesn't have to be all at once. It doesn't mean you have to join a gym, you know, necessarily. You know, anything that your body gets in motion, it's gonna help your sugars. Okay, uh, a little bit of kind of a down and dirty question. Um, we talk a lot as providers about what's called a hemoglobin A1C. A1C is the, is the term. What does that mean? From a provider perspective, an A1C is basically a measure of how well your diabetes is controlled. And our goal for that number is always to be less than seven. And we check that every three months because it gives you an average of your blood sugar over the last three months. Um, so that's really a number when we say learn your A1C. We really do want you to know what your A1C is and really shoot for that goal of less than seven. In some patients, we can't quite get there because maybe they drop too low or have some other things, but as close as we can to seven without having really low sugars that you're feeling bad. So that's the A1C, very important to know, to know that, that number. Which brings to this, the second, another question about down and dirty with the diabetes is what numbers, what really blood sugars are you going for? So for fasting, by fasting that term means first, first thing before you've had anything to really eat or drink is a fast. Um, generally that's when you wake up from your longest period of sleep um, is what that would be considered. And your goal per the, it's called the ADA, the American Diabetic Association, Less than 140 is you're going to be your goal for fasting, and less than 180 is going to be your goal after a meal. And those are the general guidelines, though I will say the more stricter guidelines, the, really the best control would even be less than 120 fasting and less than 140 after a meal. So those are your ideal targets, okay? So there's kind of general targets and, and ideal. But again, that's something that you definitely want to do one-on-one -on -one with your provider. Um, but it is important because patients ask, why do I have to keep checking? You know, why can't you just do that A1C for three months? Why do I have to keep poking myself? You know, what is the point of that? And I think there is a really important points to that self-checking of the sugars because what happens is that that way you directly as the patient can see oh okay my sugar was you know 200 and you realize okay I just had you know such and such for lunch and you realize well you know maybe I should have had that you know so it does kind of help you yourself kind of fine-tune things with your diet and it definitely helps myself as a provider to also do the treatment and fine tune what I'm gonna recommend for a treatment plan for you based on those sugars. So I love when patients bring in their log books to me because then we can really get into the nitty and gritty of how we can get these, these numbers better. So it really is important to do self-monitoring and to know that A1C number. Okay. And then last but not least, and then we'll open it up to some questions, is the question I guess the most, will I get end up being put on insulin if I'm a diabetic? You know, patients are just scared of that, you know, idea, will I get on insulin? And that's a complicated, you know, 
question and answer because it very much depends on the individual patient, variety of factors, how long, say, you've been diabetic, um, some genetic play a role there, how insulin resistant, those kind of things, how well managed. So it really just depends. There's definitely a chance that you may end up on insulin the longer you are a diabetic. Good news, actually great news I would say, is that there really are some amazing newer diabetic medications out there. And several of them now really help with weight loss. They kind of help you feel a little bit full faster. They kind of process those carbs a little bit better so that you feel full faster and you tend to be able to lose some weight. And that's really wonderful because unfortunately with some of the older school medicines, and even with insulin, it has a tendency to make you gain weight. And of course, with diabetes, you want you to lose weight and keep your diabetes controlled. So really some great new medications that we have that kind of target those things. Now, I'll be honest, some of them are injectable medications as well, even though they're not necessarily insulin. So I want to try to get that idea of a shot always being bad, you know, out of your head. If it really does a good thing for your body, they can be some great medications. So again, those kind of things you'll figure out one with one with your provider. Um, but really some great things that we have to, 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 to treat diabetes. Um, so I think that's probably... Um, all I'm going to talk about, because I'm going forever and ever on diabetes, it's a, again, it's something that we see all the time, so I'm very happy to talk about it, but I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions, so um, I'm going to go ahead and have my moderator help me, and I'll start fielding some questions, hopefully, that have come in. If someone is on a fixed income, how would they get help with the cost of supplies and medications? Okay, yeah, so um, in terms of that, um, of course some of it depends on your insurance status, right? But at Grace Health, we have what are called resource specialists and have other um, people that can really help both in finding if there's some good community resources in terms of like the fresh food programs, or there's a lot of various churches and places that do have free meals and that um, available. A registered dietitian can help you kind of create a meal plan that can be more cost effective. Um, so you're not feeling like you're spending so much on your groceries and sometimes figuring out how to use certain foods in more than one way can be really helpful. So because we have such a great staff and other people that can help not just from a provider perspective, you know, I think you can get a lot of help with that, you know, at, at Grace. And we're very understanding, of course, financially because food and those are, these are expensive, you know, these are expensive things. Also our pharmacy staff. Oh, I forgot to mention that early. I didn't mean to not uh, shout out to our great pharmacy staff too that can really um, help as well um, in terms of medication cost. We do get special um, discounts at Grace because we are a federally qualified health center and some really great medications and stuff are really deeply discounted at our pharmacy that doesn't happen at some of the other pharmacies because of our um, health center status. So really a variety of things we can do to help make managing diabetes um, cost affordable. Great. Um, we have another one. I've heard about the food pharmacy at Grace Health. Can you tell us more about it? Yeah, so wonderful program that was started by our amazing Kirby Lee, who is our amazing registered dietitian. And it's actually a program where I believe it is, is it weekly or bi-weekly? That part I'm not 100%. We can, um, I, I definitely have to look at it. I believe it's either weekly or bi-weekly that you get fresh food delivered. I, I know some patients get it delivered to their home and some patients um, pick it up at Grace. Um, just de de depending, um, and it depends. You have to, you know, meet certain conditions and qualify. But diabetes is definitely one of those. And in these packages, you get fresh food, and you also get um, some like some herbs and things. It actually has recipes so that you can actually kind of put these different foods together and actually create really healthy recipes plans and things that you've never maybe had before. And usually, if I if I know correctly, I believe that patients stay on that program for about a year. 
you know, so it's not just like a couple times thing. It's something really regularly that you get this, so it can really, you know, help solidify that how to follow those that diabetic diet. Oh, it looks like we got an answer. It is biweekly, so every two weeks um, that that um, that happens. Is there someone who can help people who can't remember or don't understand how to take their sugars or meds? Yes, so depending on if you qualify, we also have um, chronic care coordinators and chronic care nurses. So these are special RNs that really go above and beyond um, what you'd kind of consider um, you know, average care we'll provide. So they really help those patients that really maybe have a little bit extra need in coordinating the medications. Maybe they're seeing a lot of various specialists that need some coordination with care, with getting to the specialist, taking the medications, or right, getting to their appointments. So these are really people that really kind of help the whole picture with, with the patient and those ones that have special needs. And there is certain criteria. It's not available necessarily to all patients. It kind of depends on your conditions and you know how often those conditions cause you complications such as going to the hospital and those kind of those kind of things. But if you do qualify for that, we really have very like all inclusive care to help to help manage that. I have diabetes in my family but don't have it yet. What can I do to prevent it? Oh yeah, great, great, great question. Yeah, everybody has diabetes in their family, right? One in three uh, adult Americans is diabetic or pre-diabetic. So we all have diabetes in, in, in our family, right? So what to do to prevent it? So we cannot help your genetic makeup, right? Who your mom, dad is, you know, you, you're blessed with who, with who you are. But what things can you, can you control? And I would say that would be those, those lifestyle things, those healthy lifestyle things, the diet and exercise piece. So <clears throat> I would say really, even if you're not, again, diabetic yourself, but you don't run strong in your family, start following some of these guidelines that we were talking about. Try to do that half plate where you do more fresh fruits and vegetables. Try to get more exercise into your you know, diet. But the realization that this is really something that can happen to you in five years down, maybe 10 years down the road, maybe even sooner. You know, So if you start kind of following already those kind of diet pieces that I was talking about earlier, you can really significantly decrease your risk. Same thing with weight loss. Again, just a modest amount of weight loss, five to 10% of your body weight, if lost, can already much significantly reduce your chances of becoming a diabetic. And, and to kind of piggyback a little bit on that, I also get questions often about um, gestational diabetes, meaning you get diabetes when you're pregnant. And that's a reasonably common thing to happen. And then I, I think the problem is sometimes women don't realize how important follow-up is on that because they're told, okay, I'm not diabetic anymore after I delivered, you know, baby. Um, but the studies say that one in two of those women, so 50% of them, half of them, go on to being diabetic within just a five to 10 year after that pregnancy. So very short you know, follow up. So especially if you have history of gestational diabetes, you really wanna continue those good um, habits you know, even, you know, even well before, um, well really throughout your life, I would say, to decrease that risk of, of, of turning a full blown diabetic. Why do people say drinking more water will help? Oh, so water has a good, it can kind of help with what I call satiety. So it can help make you feel fuller. There's a lot of great studies out there that, that actually say if you drink a full um, glass of water before each meal, you know, you make it a point, you got your meal in front of you, but you got your glass of water, you drink that, a lot of times that will help that feeling of fullness and you tend to not eat as much then. Um, and, and it's interesting because water has like zero calories, right? There's really, you know, nothing, uh, you know, else in it, but it really has that nice property. That in it really helps your body be well hydrated, of course. It helps your kidney filter and those kind of things. And so water is a really important diet, a really important part of, 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 your, di of your diet. And it can really help you feel a little bit full, even a little bit faster. So generally, I say one before each meal, and then try to have another extra glass even between the meals.
foods too. and then you know you but write about your six to eight glasses a day is really where you want to try to shoot for, i would say, would be a reasonable goal. ann why shouldn't diabetics drink alcohol? what if it's not a fruity, sugary kind of drink? mm-hmm. so you know alcohol in general is really, really bad on, on, on blood sugars. of course the sugary kind is the worst, but even even any kind of alcohol is considered really to raise your, your, your blood sugars. And, it's, and, it, and it can raise your blood pressure as well, and those do tend to go, to go hand in hand. So really important to minimize alcohol use as much as, as possible because it really can raise um, sugars and whether that's and especially if that you know beer, wine, sugar, I mean really any kind of alcohol is going to bring those sugars those sugars up. So you want to avoid it as much as possible. Um, how can I tell if my family member's blood sugar is too low or too high if they don't have their monitor on them all the time? Mm -hmm. So tough, tough, because sometimes um, if you've been diabetic a long time. Sometimes you lose that um, that body telling you that you're that you're low low or high. It really, the key really is to try, if at all possible, to have your glucometer with you. General symptoms of low sugar hypoglycemia is generally feeling sweaty, feeling shaky, feeling confused, mentally foggy, and to the point where, of course, it goes low enough you can actually pass out. So those are probably your most common symptoms. If you know the person has a tendency toward low sugars, I recommend that person always have some kind of, in this case, a carb heavy snack. Uh, because the concern is you could be somewhere that you don't, cannot get food, and if your sugar continues to drop, it can drop to a real dangerous level that you really can pass out, fall in an unsafe place, hit your head, get a concussion, of course, I mean, things that we would never want to happen. So ideally to try to have that glucometer, but a lot of times some people do have those warning symptoms to tell you. Now again, not everybody has those, so I don't 100% rely on those, but they definitely can. High blood sugars, hyperglycemia, sometimes can be a little similar, but I would say that more you tend to feel dizzy, you start to feel really, really thirsty, you're urinating a lot, like compared that you don't, you feel like you're peeing a lot more than what you're necessarily drinking. Um, and then your, your urine can even start to get that sweeter, that almost that sweet smell to it. That sounds weird. Urine usually doesn't smell good, right? But sugars get high enough and you can notice that in the urine. So those are probably more of the symptoms with the sugars being too high. Um, but again, sometimes it's really hard to read. So the ideal best is to definitely have that, that glucometer with you, especially if you're one that does tend to have really wide swings in terms of being too high or too low. What is a sick day plan? Oh, a sick day plan. So a sick day plan, that can be for really any kind of chronic condition, of course, diabetes included, meaning, um, what what do you do if and with diabetes sick day can be your sugar is going too low going too high you don't feel good it's causing your neuropathy to hurt to hurt worse you're having some 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 blurred vision i'm going to pee a lot more often if any way that you feel not as like you should related to the diabetes can be considered a sick day so basically you need to know you need to have that plan with your doctor like hey if I get this or this, should I be doing something different? You know, if you're on insulin, should there be a plan to increase or decrease that amount of insulin or increase or decrease certain medicines or limit exercise or food, you know, to kind of depending on the, on the scenario. And I think that's a very individual plan with your provider, but it basically is having that plan in place, especially if it's something that's happened to you before where your diabetes does cause you complications to not feel good, like including if you have to miss work or school, those, those kind of things, and that does happen. So if you have got kind of that foresight with your provider to have that plan, you know, because sometimes you can't get, a, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder to get a hold of that provider, right? We try to, you know, have um, after hours nursing staff and great things that help us, but sometimes you need that plan specific with, that you made with the provider for that. So that's kind of that sick day plan.
this fruit have a lot of sugar in it? Yeah, so fruit is again in that carbohydrate category that we were talking about earlier. If you're going to compare fruit to veggies, definitely your veggies are going to have more fiber and are going to have less sugar content than your fruit, okay? So if you're comparing the two. But however, a fruit is still a much better choice than those simple carbs that we talked about, the pretzels, the cookies, the candies, the sweets. So yes, they have sugar, but it's a more, it's a more fibrous to it too, and it's that complex carb. So versus those simple carbs, you're gonna have a little bit more even keel and less of this up, up and down. So still good, but if you do them in excess, so you sit down and eat 10 apples, it's probably gonna raise your sugar more than what you would like. So of course, everything in moderation too, and that includes fruit, you know, that definitely includes fruit as well, but I think it's definitely part of a really healthy and balanced diabetic diet. Why do some diabetics see a special doctor for the kidneys? Okay, yes. So those are called nephrologists. A nephrologist is a doctor that specializes with kidney issues. And um, they're extremely, extremely important because kidney troubles are very common related to diabetes. The question was specifically, why do would you need to see one? Okay, so you know it depends on how much that diabetes is affecting your kidneys. Um, if it gets to the a significant degree, and of course that's things that we look at with blood work and urine and those kind of things. So you know that's a provider discretion. But if it gets significant enough that it's affecting how well your kidneys work, your kidneys need to be able to filter your blood, um, and that includes all the medicines and things that we take, right? So if it's not doing that properly, the worry is that you can get sick a lot more easily, and the eventual concern is that you could end up being on dialysis, where your kidneys really are completely failing. So we want to make sure that we refer to timely matter um, with diabetics, so we don't wait, you know, too, you know, too long or down the road. But unfortunately, those kidney complications we see really often hand in hand with diabetes. And so we do often partner with our nephrologist um, colleagues because we, you know, we need them. This is, this is a disease that is affecting people's kidneys in a really serious way. So yeah, we definitely like lean on our nephrologist when we need to. Though I will say, um, we certainly work with family practice can do a good job of monitoring uh, mild to moderate kidney disease. It does not necessarily mean that every patient with a little bit of mild kidney dysfunction necessarily have to see a nephrologist. I think it depends on the individual scenario, but yes, we certainly do use them when needed. How would a therapist help someone with diabetes? Oh yeah, what if the person is not depressed? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so great question. So diabetes, because it affects so many things in your body and your life, I think there's a, there's, there can be some stigma with it and it can be really hard to process that diagnosis as, as, as a person emotionally, not just physically, but emotionally, right? That's a big diagnosis to be told you're now diabetic. And even in someone that has no prior mental health history, no necessarily depression, it could be really hard to deal with that diagnosis as to how to go forward and still you know, live your life, but figure out how to manage this diabetes while you're working and dealing with, with, your, with your kids and doing all your things you have to do to keep your home up and those kind of things, right? It's a lot on the mental health, and I think that's where our behavioral health consultants at Grace Health can be really, really helpful, even with those that don't actually have underlying depression because the physical and mental health are very tied. That some over the counter medications might not be safe for diabetics. How do I know which ones? Mm -hmm. Great, another great question. This is kind of goes back to my prior point of you've got to have that one on one relationship with your provider. I think that that's key, um, and I think it really is important to know again to know your medications and to always tell your provider all your medications because the over-the-counter one those are the ones that tend to be missed people don't think of those as really a medicine so a lot of times they won't tell me that they're taking them not that they're necessarily trying to withhold 
hold anything. It's just sometimes those aren't, those aren't thought of. Same thing with like herbs and, and, and supplements. And they can interact with a lot of the medications we can prescribe. And it can even cause some damage to kidneys, liver, those kind of things, you know, if not taken appropriately or depending on what medicines you take. So I think the key, it's not necessarily which ones are safe because every patient is going to be a little bit different depending on their other underlying health issues. If they have some kidney disease, you know, liver disease, if they have any digestional issues um, too, it really depends on some of those underlying issues. So I think each scenario is a little bit different. So I, my general takeaway would be don't take over the counter medicines without consulting your provider. Consider them just like any other uh, medication that you you need to get the okay from your provider because those really can depend. What does type one and type two mean? Mm -hmm. So the probably the majority of this lecture, I'm really talking about the type two diabetes. The type two diabetes is the kind that you get through time, okay? Because again, the body, uh, the hormone that our body makes insulin, um, over time has a harder time keeping up with what we're putting in to our body, the carbs we're putting in. So type two diabetes is something that happens th through time. Whereas type one diabetes is a very specific genetic kind of diabetes um, that you get very, from a very young age. Usually it, 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 it's children, usually it's kids though. Some can be missed. Uh, maybe they don't have enough symptoms that are caught until a little bit later, but it's usually in childhood and managed very differently because a type one basically is body is the, it really is not making insulin. The insulin that it's making is not, wor is not working. So they're definitely treated a little bit differently. Some of the medications and things that I was discussing are really focused on the type two. The type one, you're unfortunately gonna be on, on insulin is gonna be your definitely mainstay um, of treatment. And it can be, it can lead to, a, it could potentially lead to more complications because it's generally diagnosed from a younger age. However, we're starting to see type two diabetes younger and younger. You know, we think of it generally as an adult disease, but there's even some teenagers that are diagnosed as a type two, maybe because those early childhood choices in terms of those healthy eating and exercise habits that we were talking about, maybe we just didn't have good access to those, you know, and so we can see type two from a young age, but very different. Most of my lecture today is really more targeted toward that type two, because that's where the majority of patients are gonna lie. If meters keep track of blood sugars, why do doctors still want to log? Oh, yeah, and I think that's a that might be a preference at a at an individual provider. I will say, me on a personal basis, um, meters can be a little finicky, and sometimes it's hard when I'm going back in and trying to figure out, okay, what time? And sometimes they're on that military time, right? So they're like 1600, and you're trying to figure out, okay, what time of day was that? There was that reading. So it just can be a little bit complicated if it's not right. And me as the provider, it's not my meter, and I'm looking and I'm trying to figure out. So for me, it really just makes just it easier um, to put out a paper. And I try to make it as simple as possible, really the time and you know what it was. If I want more from you, I might have you start doing some diet stuff in terms of what you ate. You know, but a basic log book, the time and the, the number, and it doesn't have to be anything fancy. We now have these just regular sheets of paper in Grace Health that are log sheets, and we can use those for blood pressure and various things too. Um, but I think that that just helps give me a quicker snapshot and, and a shorter time period so I can really fine tune my decisions for my medicines and treatment plan, especially if you're insulin and that kind of thing. I can really tailor things better when you have it kind of written out like that because I can really look at that quickly and make that those decisions. Whereas looking through a meter might just take a little bit more time and be a little bit harder um, to get to get the times right on them. What do I do with used lancets and needles? Okay, yes, yeah. so um, usually you're gonna wanna dispose of those and generally any fire police department will will take those for the most part. There's there's different there's different places through town that will take them to. Our pharmacy I know doesn't dispose of them. I believe certain ones do. I'd have to double check that if that's a Walgreens or Rite Aid. But I know in general your your safest bet is gonna be any police fire station will take will take those no questions asked. Um, does having diabetes mean you'll have to poke yourself for the rest 
rest of your life. <laughs> yes, the heroic pope that nobody likes. <laughs> so the answer to that is it depends. Um, the answer is it, is it depends on that. Um, if you have very well controlled type 2 diabetics, say your A1Cs have been, I'd say example, less than, less than 6 and have been stable through a long time, I might tell that, that patient, you know, as long as you keep up, you know, taking your medications like we talked about, or if they're not in medicines and they're just doing diet and exercise, and you don't feel bad or start to feel like ill or having other symptoms, I might tell them you don't necessarily have to have to check. You know, so there are some patients that are diabetic that don't necessarily poke and check themselves regularly, that are well controlled, not having any complications, not having issues. Um, I'll be honest, probably the majority of our diabetics, that's probably not where you fall. You know, probably the majority um, are going to have a little trouble, you know, here and there, are going to see some high sugar. So for the majority of patients, we want you to check. And that's an individual thing, again, with the provider, depending on how your sugar is with how many times a day. If you're reasonably well controlled, one time a day might be enough. Poor control, you talk it probably a few, few times, you know, in the day. Are there any helpful diabetic apps through my phone or website? Oh, yes. Um, I should, I should look up specific ones to post, but I know that there's just a lot of good um, data out there. I don't know the specific names of sites specifically, but I know that there's a lot of apps if you look up, you know, healthy food or diabetic diet and those that, that will probably come up. I don't have a set one off the top um, of my head, but I know that there's a lot of those out there. And I don't, probably the last question I'll answer too is that people ask if there really is a set diet, like that they really should be doing. Like, should I do keto? Should I do Weight Watchers? Should I do South Beach? Should I, you know? And I, I, I want to kind of stress with diabetes, you don't want to consider yourself on a very specific diet that's restrictive because you feel like you're going to have a tendency to fail if it's something that's very hard to follow. So with diabetes, I always say, you know, consider that you're just making good, healthy lifestyle changes for life. Not that you're on a diet, that these are healthy changes that you're going to be doing for your lifespan. You know, and that's where I want people to, to think of when we say that term diabetic. I don't even like that term diet necessarily so much. Okay. I think those are all our questions. All right. Yes, so reminder about the raffle. If you um, we need you to call um, as soon as soon as you can, we we're hoping to have the calls coming in um, while I was talking. Um, and again it was to the phone number two six nine. 441-6801 and you call that number and you leave your name and phone number and so you're interested in the raffle um, for the Facebook Live and if you're a winner of one of our fabulous prizes someone will be getting a hold of you and letting you know. So thank you everyone for your attention. Um, hopefully you all gleaned a little something out of the talk today. Hopefully there will be future Facebook Live uh, presentations. But until then, have a good evening and be healthy. Bye-bye.